welcome back. Um, last time we solved problem 7, or day 7, having to do yet again with the int code computer. Um, today, I somewhat ambitiously have decided, um, I've generated three new files, problem 08, 09, and 010, and we'll see just how far we get. All right, day eight, the space image format. The elves' spirits are lifted when they realize you have an opportunity to reboot one of their Mars rovers, and so they are curious if you would spend a brief sojourn on Mars. You land your ship near the rover. When you reach the rover, you discover that it's already in the process of rebooting. It's just waiting for someone to enter a BIOS password. The elf responsible for the rover takes a picture of the password, your puzzle input, and sends it to you via the digital sending network. Unfortunately, images sent via the digital sending network aren't encoded with any normal encoding. Instead, they're encoded with a special space image format. None of the elves seem to remember why this is the case. They send you the instructions to decode it. They couldn't just send you the password, they had to send you the instructions to decode the BIOS password for their rover that's sitting on Mars. You know, just in case somebody else happens to be on Mars, and they wouldn't want anybody else to boot it. So, <laughs> who knows what a robot on Mars could do. Um, images are sent as a series of digits that each represent the color of a single pixel. The digits will fill each row of the image, left to right, then move downward to the next row, filling rows top to bottom until every pixel of the image is filled. Each image actually consists of a series of identically sized layers that are each filled in this way. So the first digit corresponds to the top left pixel of the first layer. The second digit corresponds to the pixel to the right of that on the same layer, and so on until the last digit, which corresponds to the bottom right pixel of the final layer. Uh, for example, given an image three pixels wide and two pixels tall, the image data, that number, corresponds to these image layers. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh, one, two. Um, the image you received is 25 pixels wide and six pixels tall. To make sure the image wasn't corrupted during transmission, the elves would like you to find the layer that contains the fewest zero digits. On that layer, what is your number of one digits multiplied by the number of two digits? All right, so we're talking about a layer. <laughs> um. So a layer has a width, and a layer has a height, and there's some number of layers where each layer is 25 by 6. Okay, let's work on this sample input. Um, so that corresponds to this number, and if I go run this script, we get back this number, right? Or this, well, string. You could call it a number. There it goes. <laughs> Warning, the expression's unused. Oh no, I could print it, but um. So, let's see. Um, how am I gonna do this? We'll find the layer with the fewest zero digits. Normally, I would be forming data structures right about now. Um, but this problem, I don't know, I guess we'll take a look at the sample input in a minute, but this problem doesn't seem, um, challenging. Alright, so, I guess I could create a data class layer um, and then we'll say input of type string and 
What is this? Oh, can only take a veil or var. So we're going to call that a veil. And I guess on here make a... Um, how do I declare functions again? Is it def count? I don't know. Count equals what? Oh, and then I want this to be um, s string. No. I don't know the data types in Kotlin. Is it just char or is it character? Equals input dot, no? Really? All right. I have completely forgotten Kotlin because I have been switching back and forth between Java, Scala, and Kotlin and can't remember which is which. <laughs> All right, so let's see. If I look up an example of a data class in Kotlin, surely I'm not the only person to be confused by this. Um, so you can declare uh, a var within the data class. Um, I just forget how to declare like functions inside of a Kotlin class. And I think that um, ordinary Kotlin classes as well as data classes can have functions to find within them. So yeah, I'm not totally sure. That's kind of unfortunate. Like the top three examples I'm looking at all borrow from each other. <laughs> so data class. Yeah, I'm not totally sure what's going on there. Um, here, if I use autocomplete with a completely blank space, is this going to... Oh, fun. Fun is the way that you have fun in Kotlin. Yeah. Um, nice. Char equals input dot match matches <laughs> uh, I mean yeah I could change the char into a regex and such uh, oh nice wow this is really pointing out how ridiculous this is um, so, yeah, how great is that count function? All right, so if I make a layer, uh, actually, wait, val layer zero of type layer. Equal to layer one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Print a line of layer zero dot count of zero. Except that's not a char. All right, just kidding. All right, show me how many zeros there are in that number that has exactly one zero in it. Wow, even here. Oh, I'm sorry, this doesn't resolve. Wow, okay. Um, all right, all right. Fine. I guess we're going to do this the dumb way. C is equal to D. I can't believe I have to do that. There's got to be a more concise way to write this. But, 
we should get a count of one. <clears throat> if I could match my example to like what was actually there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that's great. I mean, the program returned the right value, but it shows, uh, it's just a wonderful premonition of what's to come. All right, so now what? Um, I guess I want to construct an image of multiple layers, right? So, how do I split a string into strings that are of an exact number of characters. Like, I don't care about how wide and how tall a thing is at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like there should be a way to take a string and split it into fixed length things. Um, I'll give it... I'll see if there's a solution for this. I'm not too proud to look it up. Um, string slice, perhaps? String substring, string take. Take n characters from a string. Or the entire sequence, if it happens to be shorter. That'll work. Um, now, question... Oh, no, there is a take while. Well, that's not exactly what I'm looking for. There is a Kotlin text package. Um, slice, perhaps? Uh, I kind of like take, though. I just feel like there's got to be something I'm missing here. There's take last while. Take last while predicate char boolean sequence. That takes things one char at a time. There's take while. Um, there's replace. There's take. I suppose the comparison to see how many characters are actually left in this character sequence is something I could write myself. Um. All right, so now what? Oh, I can make a mutable list and populate the mutable list. Duh. And this here doesn't know, need to know that the list is mutable. Um, input dot what? Um, also, this is a layer. Yeah, layer's probably the right level of abstraction there. And if I want to make an image, it's going to be composed of layers. Um, val image zero is equal to mutable list of, uh, beautiful. All right. Oh, do I have to declare a type here? String. Fine. I suppose you need the end bracket, too. All right. Um, while. Ooh. I don't like that. I want something that's going to take a string and split it into strings of fixed dimension. I'm still going to look this up. String split, oh, Kotlin, split uh, by length, chunked. What is this chunked? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so now what? 
image zero is going to be, let's just take our sample input and not worry about um, the data structure just yet. 789012, chunked, yes. Chunked in groups of six dot map into layer new layer. Um, yeah. By the way, our cotton class is. I suppose I could look at any cotton class to figure this out. Kotlin classes are uppercase, right? And I've been making them all lowercase because I'm being ridiculous. Um, all right, let's go to Stack Overflow, find any code example that involves creating a data type. You'd think there'd be more of those. Um, all right. Let's look for an example of a Kotlin data class. Data class. Yeah, okay. Uppercase is the standard. So let's, however many streams we are into this, start following some sort of standard and see if we can spell while we're at it. Right, image zero. Now, can I summon? No. Print line, image zero. Dot sum. Nope. All right, map. Oh wait, so I have to find, what's even the data type of this? This, this is a sequence of layers. Um, convert property initializer to getter. Convert to lay, do, do, do. I don't understand what most of these things are. Convert property initializer to getter. Um, Convert to lazy property. Move lambda argument into parentheses. Um, I think what you're saying is that this is such a simple expression it doesn't require a lambda. Or that something like this. I can do that, right? Um, it's looking like I cannot, in fact, do this. Unresolved reference. So I think I have to name uh, this property getter or setter expected. All right, whatever. So what was this hint? Uh, specify explicit lambda signature. Move lambda argument into parentheses. Oh, move the argument of the lambda into parentheses but I think you're also saying that if I specify things that way I can do this and damn it IDE don't put things where I don't want them okay unresolved sure let's create a local variable input Oh, I see. Whatever. Yeah, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong here. I'm jumping too much between languages. Um, so here, I don't know what the type of this is. Array of, list of, sequence of, set of. Oh, okay. Well, that's weird. 
What is the type returned by chunked? Returns a list of string. Okay. Um, so if this is a list of string and I'm mapping it, what I should end up with by the time I'm done is a list of layer, right? And since this is a list, okay, now I get the autocomplete. I'm confused why I didn't see that earlier. Um, okay, regardless, now we do have a list. Um, sum by. You know, I'm curious. Layer, layered account of zero. You know, it would help if I could remember my own conventions. All right, so we should see that there is, in fact, one zero in the image. Unresolved reference, new. Thank you. Oh, all right, let's try that. That probably works better if I like write without the new word there. Um, one. All right, there's one zero in this image. Now, do I actually need that arrow syntax? Um, man, there's still something about this that I'm not... Maybe Scotla is just that much more terse or succinct. So we want to find the layer containing the fewest zero digits. And we want to get the number of one digits multiplied by the number of two digits. Okay. Um, so I've got a list of layers. Um, so veil layer zero is layer is equal to image zero dot uh, min by and we want layer layer dot count of the character zero. Uh, of course, this is going to say that there is, yeah, this is optional, so potentially there might not be a match inside that image, even though we totally know there is. <clears throat> and then here, we want to print out layer zero dot count of one times layer zero or yeah layer zero dot count of two oh yeah and then i have to do the question mark the elvis operator because we might not have such a layer and then we have an optional int multiplied by an optional int so you know what i'm just going to assert that for purposes of what we're doing, um, no, there's definitely uh, such a match. Um, more actions. Let's do an asserted call. Double exclamation point at the end for great success. All right. Welcome, user man two. So we're on day eight. I did entitle this correctly, right? Yes, good. All right, so there's one one and one two in this example. Um, do I want to do anything, anything more structured here? Sure. So instead of making layer my only data class. Uh, let's create a data class image. 
Uh, val input is going to be a list of layer. Um, and I guess I don't really need any more than that. <laughs> this is just a type pun for that, but all right. Uh, image zero is going to be an alt type image. And we're just gonna take all of this and cram it in there. Call that good. Um, image zero dot input. All right. And then refactor rename this from input something meaningful like layers um, so there's still almost certainly a more concise way to write this stuff but um, yeah layer zero count and layer zero count uh, could define a get layer function that would do exactly this min by thing but don't see the point all right Let's get our puzzle input. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, where am I going to store that? Uh, let's exit distraction free mode and full screen mode and all that jazz. Uh, so first, exit full screen exit distraction free mode because I have solved this problem before of where do I put resources that don't really fit inside my source code um, unless I'm just making that up and that's all something I only did with uh, Scala possibly all right well so we're on problem 08 we have a source directory you have external libraries. Where would I even put something that's just like a plain text file? I have no idea what I'm doing. We've got favorites. Those are good. We've got a structure. Maybe. Probably don't need strings.kt open. Um, I mean, I could just stuff it in the source directory new resource perhaps new resource bundle okay let's just see how big this thing is uh, it fits on a line all right I guess I didn't need to panic about that I can use it yeah that's what I was looking for was it all right we're gonna go back into Distraction free mode. Uh, get our web browser back up there. We'll get our console back in just a minute. But, um, yeah, so I don't need to do layer, layer count. I can do it count, and I can do layer it. I can do all the things on it. I once tried to call an iterator it and did something stupid. It was funny, but, um, all right, so val, I don't know, input is equal to that. Beautiful, beautiful input. Image one is equal to, oh, of type image, even though I don't need to do that, but image input dot chunked, that's not chunked. And my image happens to be 25 by 6. I could split that up. Don't feel like doing it right now. Uh, map. Uh, my lap. map is going to be layer it. All right. Gets the job done. Um, yeah. And then we just do the same thing. Except for the new image. Layer 1. And let's call it a wrap. 
I suppose on this original thing, I hard-coded a six. I meant to say three times two. You can forgive me for that. All right. <laughs> that seems likely, right? One. All right. Uh, let's try that again. Pretty sure one is not the right answer. Oh, and yeah, over here, I can say if it is equal to D. That's a nice improvement. 1064. You think it's still 1064 here? I think so. Yeah. All right, let's get Santa home. Let's go on to part two. Now you are ready to decode the image. The image is rendered by stacking the layers and aligning pixels with the same positions in each layer. The digits indicate the color of the corresponding pixel. Zero is black, one is white, and two is transparent. The layers are rendered with the first layer in front and the last layer in back. So if a given position has a transparent pixel in the front and in the first and second layers, a black pixel in the third layer, and a white pixel in the fourth layer, the final image would have a black pixel at that position. For example, given this image uh, corresponds to these layers, so there's a zero and some twos, then there's a one and some twos, and I guess a two is transparent, then there's a one down here, and a zero down here, and so then the full image can be found by determining the top visible pixel in each position. Top left pixel is black, and top right pixel is white, etc. So the final image has this appearance. What message is produced after decoding your image? Santa. It's got to be Santa. No, all right. I guess we'll find out, but um, it's probably some something silly. Um, but it fits in a 25 by 6 area, so you have to think, like, what could possibly fit in a 25 by 6 image? I guess we'll find out. Um, all right, so I made a layer. I made an image. I'm already thinking back to what I recently went through in Scala and with like fold left and scan left and stuff and I'm trying to think of like does Kotlin have anything like that? Uh, let's have some fun. Fun decode is equal to one. All right, we solved it. No. Um, I guess I want to have a way to merge two layers. Um, so, layer of type layer. No, let's first define a merge per character. Uh, C char. Also, I don't like using D as a character when I could use C here, so let's stick with that convention. All right. Um, if, um, oh, hang on. Uh, let's see. Input is a string, but a string is really a char sequence. Um, input dot map. Also, I don't like the word input there anymore. So we're getting rid of input and giving this a good name. Um, God, layer is such a terrible word to use here. Um, colors might be okay. Digits is fine. Uh, Data. Data is a wonderful name for a variable. It's very informative. 
Um, we're gonna pick colors. Uh, all right. Fun merge. Um, L layer is equal to colors dot map. Oh, nice. All right, and for each it, the iterator, um, if it is equal to two, uh, oh wait, I want to iterate across both this and the other at the same time. I want to like zip the two together, but the zip is a Scala word. Um, how do I do some sort of special map? Map indexed, map index not null, flat map, zip. Nice! Zip is a thing here too. Okay. Uh, other char sequence. And then you need a transform. I'm so confused. Let me look this up. Um, Kotlin <laughs> string zip. Oh, okay, so you could say string zip string. And then I can start worrying about reducing it or transforming it. Like, wait, no, oh, I can pass in a transform body there too. Nice. Colors.zip L.colors. And then if I want to provide a body here, I can. And here I could say A comma B. Um, if if A is equal to two, B else A. I don't think that's valid, Kotlin. I think. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're a total leet hacksaw coder here. Alright, so what's the deal? What have I bungled here already? Type inference failed. Other char sequence. Transform char char. Cannot be applied to receiver string arguments. String and then something. Um, I thought it was okay. A string is a char sequence. I think it's just complaining about something stupid I did here. What could I have done wrong here? Here, let's just say a kind of arrow a. Maybe I need a sing. There we go, that kind of arrow. If a is equal to 2, b else a. Because two is transparent, right? So, and we could even declare if we wanted to that this returns a string. Okay, what have I done now? A list of char. Okay, fair point. No need to declare that. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I had to use that arrow. I'm slowly um, beginning to understand how to type valid stuff that actually compiles. All right, so now what? <laughs> Decode is just going to be like layers dot fold and layer dot merge. No, I don't want to have the function. I don't want to have that be a member of um, layer. I want to define a way of merging here. Um, yuck. 
Well, actually, here we go. Uh, layers dot fold. No, this needs an initial value. I guess I want reduce. Operation. Yeah. All right. So if we have two values, um, layer. How? Uh, I'm confused how these other uh, values are accessible in this scope. Like, oh my goodness. I am doing poorly at coming up with good names. Yeah, valid code is a myth. A comma B. There we go. Picking really solid variable names. Okay, now what have I done wrong? What I've done wrong is um, everything. Because reduce doesn't use the same syntax as this up here. This here wanted... I don't remember. Reduce operation. Okay, so this needs parentheses and then a simple arrow. Yeah, a comma b, a dot merge b, which of course doesn't work for like 35 different reasons. All right, so yeah, I guess this is not how I declare a function in line. Um, possibly I might need to move merge outside of the data class. Yeah, let's just move merge and see what happens. There we go. That, <laughs> whatever. I'll figure that out in a minute. Um, fun merge. Layer zero and layer one. Equals uh, layer zero dot colors dot zip with layer one dot colors. There we go. And here we can say fun decode is equal to layers dot reduce using merge. Of course, that doesn't work either. Expression is inaccessible from a nested class image. Uh, function invocation merge dot 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 expected. Okay. Let's try change to function invocation. Alt shift enter. Alt shift enter. That didn't change anything. Alt shift enter. That's trying some other key, sh key combination, right? I don't know. That indented my control my code when I did uh, control shift enter. Um, all right, we're gonna look up an example. Good gravy. Kotlin list reduce. <sighs> what have I did done wrong this time? Reduce. Oh, it needs an initial parameter, and then an A and a B, and then it can operate on. That doesn't seem right. I'm confused. All right, so the example I'm looking at looks something like this. 
Let's get rid of those braces and put some of these in. And then it has one of these kind of arrows. Um, but also, it, it now dawns on me that this merge operation doesn't really operate on two layers. It kind of does, but it kind of like doesn't create... Oh, I'm sorry, I could create a new layer out of this. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's totally what I meant to do is produce a layer. I knew that. Uh, I'm sorry, um, not there. Uh, so we've created this, and this here is a string. And that string can be encapsulated, boxed into a layer. All right. Layer, layer. Yeah. All right, so what's the deal with this? Expression is inaccessible from a nested class image. Um, wait, what's the problem here? list of char okay fine how about a char sequence are you kidding me so wait can i not zip to produce a char sequence oh it's class double colon merge to pass a ref let's back this up a bit before I got too far out of hand. Um, so let's put this merge back here so we have a visibility to it. Um, I still like the idea of wrapping this as that, but in order to do that, um, I need to take a list of char and produce a string out of it. Um, So, okay, that's ugly. Um, all right, fun D code is going to be so fun. Uh, control shift P will show the type of an expression. Oh, uh, let's type inference. Nice. Give that a shot. Reduce using layer merge okay and yeah you were saying here we're like i can use control shift p yeah there's like the type nice all right so what we're actually interested in is not that little multiplication but in um, image one dot decode um, suppose I want some reasonable way of printing that eh? well no that it, it's going to yield a layer um, so it's going to print out as one string split all the way across or sorry one string without any new line characters all right and then we're just gonna like take a look at this and figure out what that's supposed to mean there's a lot of commas here <laughs> oh i have so badly messed this up it's it's something maybe maybe not I'm amused. Layer colors equals array array whatever with all these empty spaces in there. Um, how did I mess that up? I know I'm bad, but I didn't know I was that bad. I guess I could try taking this input string. Um, and yeah, I am blocking it 
into strings of six and I am producing layers um, but maybe I do something special with these characters so I don't print them out as I don't know maybe I convert them to ints at some reasonable stage but then here like if they're ints then I have to convert the thing back that's kind of a pain Hmm. Yeah. I suppose I should define a proper matrix, assuming that Kotlin doesn't have a matrix type, which almost certainly it does. Alright. Kotlin matrix. Is this built into Kotlin? Is this recommended? No, not really. I'm sorry, there's Array. Array is probably the better thing. I think I've used a 2D array before. So... Wait. Uh, that's not quite it either. I'm maybe again confusing things with Scala. 2D array in Kotlin, courtesy of Stack Overflow. Um, int array of you so do I have to like nest arrays oh no there's an array double colon constructor for repeated logic but again that produces an array of arrays Huh. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Kotlin, you can nest arrays within each other. Okay, yeah, there's array of size, and then you have your init code within it. That's possible. I guess I just want to have some sort of... Um list or array of strings and I guess I should prefer a list because I don't like arrays but um, well no here I'm talking about a fixed dimension input there's no reason for me to be so obstinate here um, so here we have a string and I want to split that into multiple strings. Um, and maybe even here I declare that this is an array of string, but then that complicates my zipping. Yeah, I don't really so much care for that. What I'm more concerned about is, well, I also lose a zip Zip is defined like on any list type, right? I don't even know what type I'm in right now. Um, but in whatever thing I just navigated to, strings.kt, um, zip is there. But I think it's also present in any old list or collection. Okay, this makes a 2D array size 5 by 5, array 5, where each element of the array is itself an array. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, I might be shying away from that because I'm a wuss. Um, Alright, we're gonna just bite the bullet here. Um, So we're going to just con do the int conversion on the front end. And here we're going to do a map of um, it dot int or to int. There we go. So we put the bullet there. 
here. This is going to be an int. So D would actually be a decent name for it after all. All right, and then a layer. If A is equal to the number 2, B else A. And two string is not what we're. I mean, mm -mm. we don't need this um, this conversion anymore. You can just encode that as a layer. So I think that's a little more elegant. Even if it um, now we have to rewrite a little bit of this. That's okay. I think that's more than a bit more elegant. Um, minus this ugly thing I'm having to do here. Map of it dot to int. Um, and we got a one over here. All right, this compiles, but or I'm sorry, this does not generate any errors. But does it run? Does this produce one big old int array? Colors is equal to 50, 50, 49, 50, etc. Beautiful. That looks nothing like my input. Um, unless you think that 2 int is. <laughs> okay. I mean, 50 might be a, uh, a 1. I don't know. 50's probably a 2, 48's probably a 1, and so forth. Uh, so yeah, this 2 int conversion just took the literal ASCII value interpretation. Whereas if I were just subtract 0, the character from each of these, I think it would... Um, get what I'm actually seeking there. Oh, and then my comparison here where I'm saying fold this together based on a is equal to 2 would make a little bit more sense. So we got some ones and some zeros. Beautiful. All right, so just taking a quick look at that. I'm guessing it says Santa. I'm kind of joking, but uh, let's see what can we do now. <sighs> dot, dot. I want to print this out in a beautiful way somehow. Um, oh, this doesn't have an MK string like Scala has. Hmm. Mm -mm. But also, I've completely lost. Um, the notion that this is row and column based because I never tried to parse this as rows and columns in the first place. Um, yeah, so we decode and then can I chunk this? No. Chunked is not a thing here. Um, what do we have? We've got apply. We've got take if, let. All right, yeah, this is not particularly great. So we've produced a layer. There is build string. Oh. Um, not in this, but um, build string is a built-in somewhere. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Let's look that up. Build string in the Kotlin text library. String builder. Do do do. <laughs> Probably better to find an example. String and map builders on try.kotlinlang.org. Okay. Loading. Please wait. Is that literally just a string builder? 
Hmm. Return build map. <laughs> oh. Build string takes a scope. And you can do whatever you want to within the scope. Um you can use you can call append repeatedly within the scope of the body to build a string. Okay. Sure. There's no harm in it. That's probably exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, Alright. Uh, so in my layer, I have what? I've got colors. I can chunk these, as I probably should. So my images are 25 by 6 or 6 by 25 or something. So I want to split my 2D array of ints into a thing. 25 pixels wide and 6 tall. So we're going to chunk it by 25s, even though that's an int array. And then for each, do a thing. Um, yes, for each. For each list of integers, do a thing. It. Um, and then I want to print out uh, or append uh, the thing. Yeah, I guess I don't need to. It arrow is definitely not necessary. Um, map? No. Whatever. Append it. <laughs> you should figure it out. All right, unresolved reference. Oh, really? I'm amused. Okay. Um, gosh, I'm so dumb. So each list of int, I'm sorry, we have a list of int and we're calling for each on it. So, Kotlin list for each Kotlin programming language. Oh, yeah, so there's the grammar rules for each. You don't use this thing, use that thing. I knew that. Okay. Close enough. Uh, I have an extra brace down here. So brace yourselves. Build string is a wrapper around string builder. Well, that's good. All right, so I did something dumb still yet. There's no way that, like, how did my code produce that? I'm confused. Because I said chunk this in blocks of 25. Um, I guess if I'm in doubt, try, I don't know, append something else. There we go. For each block of 25, do the following. Hey, it works. Okay. Um, let's try that again. For each list of int, do the following. I guess these are arrays of 25 ints here. Alright, so then I just need to 
Um, after each of those, append a new line character. And I guess try to make sense of it from there. 25 pixels wide and six, six pixels tall. And it would help if I put my backslash here so um, this could be interpreted as a new line character. Let's try that again. All right, so, and then maybe I want to make this just a little bit more readable. Maybe I want to make this a lot more readable. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not too bad how it is. It could be worse. Could be better. Let's let's go the extra mile on this one. Make it actually readable. Do we have join here? Join to string. Separator. Char sequence. Yeah, we're. What? Empty character literal. Yeah, no, I wanted to join it. Uh, okay. Join to string. Let's use a empty string instead of an empty character. So the empty character is a has special connotations or something. All right. So uh, let's rerun that. Let's see. We're still gonna get six arrays, and it's not gonna be beautiful. Um. I stand corrected. That actually looks okay. Um, all right, this probably says something. 25 by 6. Also, it's possible that I've merged this completely backward. Um, maybe. All right, so we got some... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me not make my task impossible. So we got colors, right? Um, yeah, let's do some actual coloring. Um, it uh, equals 1. It equals 0. I'm sorry. If it is equal to 0, else that, and I don't know, something like this. Oh, no, I like nested its now. I'm being silly. Where's the last time I did a map? Yeah, with a map, we want to use this. And then within the map, we can say it is equal to zero. No. I keep wanting to use the ternary operator because that's like the only good thing about Java. Uh, at least syntactically. Um. All right, let's see, zero is black, one is white, two is transparent. Right, let's try this then. Perhaps this is more legible. Beautiful, all right. I do want to tidy this up though, because like suppose you had a transparent column somewhere in here. Also it doesn't say Santa, so this is just wrong. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. That's That can't be the answer. That needs to say Santa. I've coded it all wrong. Um, 
Actually, here, let's let's use like a little aster no. I was gonna get all cutesy. There's gotta be some beautiful way to do this. I mean our X's I think X's are a little too straining on the eyes. Let's use a little plus sign instead. Ew, that's not as beautiful somehow. I'm suddenly searching for an esoteric character on my keyboard. <laughs> Could use the at symbol. Oh, I know. This one. This one will be somewhat restful. There we go. That's the standard. All right, P. F. Chang. Got it. Yeah, we got one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. Let's go back to the calendar, having completed day eight, like the hero that we are. Day nine. No relation. All right. Uh, okay. You've just said goodbye to the rebooted rover and left Mars when you receive a faint distress signal coming over the asteroid belt. It must be the Sierra's? Sears? I don't remember how to pronounce this, but the Sierra's monitoring station. In order to lock onto the signal, you'll need to boost your sensors. The elves send up the latest boost program, basic operation of system test with the center of capitalized. That's totally not BIOS, that's boost. All right, while boost, your puzzle input is capable of boosting your sensors for tenuous safety reasons, it refuses to do so until the computer it runs on passes some checks to demonstrate it is a complete int code computer. Nice. <laughs> All right, uh, yuck. Your existing encode computer is missing one key feature. It needs support for parameters in relative mode. Parameters in mode 2, relative mode, behave very similarly to parameters in position mode. The parameter is interpreted as a position. Like position mode, parameters in relative mode can be read from or written to. The important difference is that relative mode parameters don't count from address zero, they count from a value called the relative base. The relative base starts at zero. The address a relative mode parameter refers to is itself plus the current relative base. When the relative base is zero, relative mode parameters and position mode parameters with the same value refer to the same address. For example, given a relative base of 50, a relative mode parameter of negative 7 refers to address 43. The relative base is modified with the relative base offset instruction. Opcode 9 adjusts the relative base by the value of its only parameter. The relative base increases or decreases if the value is negative by the value of the parameter. You know, for a minute there, I thought they were going to have me doing, like, real uh, stuff where you have relative addressing, where it's relative to, like, the instruction pointer or something, something that's not this relative base concept, but, like, where your pointer's at. So, um, I could see that tripping people up. This is less likely to trip people up, but also less cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for example, the relative base is 2000, and after the instruction 109, 19, the relative base would be 2019. If after, if the next instruction were 204, negative 34, then the address at, uh, the value at address 1985 would be output. Your int code computer will also need a few other capabilities. Okay, okay. The computer's available memory should be much larger than the initial program. 
Memory beyond the initial program starts with the value 0 and can be read or written like any other memory. It is invalid to try to access memory at a negative address. The computer should have support for large numbers. Some instructions near the beginning of the boost program will verify this capability. Here are some example programs that will drive you mad. The boost program will ask for a single input. Run it in test mode by providing it the value 1. It will perform a series of checks on each opcode. Output any opcodes and the associated parameter modes that seem to be functioning incorrectly. And finally, output a boost key code. Once your encode computer is fully functional, the boost program should report no functioning, no malfunctioning opcodes when run in test mode. It should only produce a single value, the boost key code. What boost key code does it produce? Okay. Well, um, I'm kind of mad about this, this here. That's fine, but couldn't you please tell me, like, the maximum dimension that has to be supported? I can make an assumption. It's going to be wrong. I could just keep fiddling with my assumptions until I fit the computer into a box that's big enough, but... Like, you're not asking me to have a computer of infinite dimension. You're certainly not asking me to constrain myself, because um, I could see how that could trip up some people. But, I... Also, yeah, uh, this uh, is annoying. So it's not just a matter of being able to allocate a ginormous block of memory, but they probably expect you to do something intelligent, which, yeah, you know my odds with that. Um, so, okay. And yes, I could define data structures to do this. It's been done like a thousand times before. I'm not super excited about this possibility of having to do that but it seems kind of necessary so I could like make a map or something was this 7 the last time I used the int code computer yes um, sorry I had to chain all these things together do I have to define any new instructions for that because I don't think I liked the way this ended well no this is not too bad I defined a program counter. It, it turned out okay. We'll start from there as my base for number 9. That's fine. Close 7, close 8. Go back into distraction free mode. Go back into full screen mode. Um, maybe I even go into presentation mode so the code's a bit larger. code's not any larger, is it? Nah, uh, barely. Um, let's bring up our embedded web browser. Probably should have experimented with how this looked a little bit before we started. Alright, so we don't need all those hooked up at the end there. We don't need this. Um, don't need any of that. All right, so, geez, there was a lot of stuff we did last uh, when we used this int code computer. Does this still run? Problem 09. Yep, we still generate the 43210 there. Okay, um... So we don't need this feedback loop. I still haven't gotten my code into like 
modules of any reasonable sort. Still deliberating if and when I want to start doing that. But copying all the code from one file to the next seems to be working okay for us so far. Um, if nothing else, it gives me the option to quickly be able to go back in time without breaking other programs. So um, let's see, read, compute, load, execute. Now we got rid of amplify. I guess we'll just call it execute now. Oh, right, and execute requires what parameters again? Um, a mutable list, a state, and an input, where the state represents the program counter and the signal being provided to the program. So our state is going to be state of the program counter and provided signal is going to be zero and we're going to just say assume that our input is zero and what's the issue now it's not mutable list and i think that'll be fine this may or may not crash but yeah all right good enough um, wait, do I have a print statement here somewhere? No, this is returning a state at the end of the execute. Yeah, that's fine. So that's where that got printed from. All right, so here are some programs that use all the new groovy features. So let's first load up this program. It takes no input and produces a copy of itself as output. Oh my goodness. That's lovely. All right. Uh, should output a 16 digit number. Um, so, oh, this will ask for a single input. Run it in test mode by providing the value one. All right, so the input we're providing we don't need to have two different sorts of inputs now, do we? This will ask for a single input. So there's no need for me to have a state where the state is comprised of the program counter and some sort of signal that gets retained from execution to execution. So we'll get rid of state. Um, you say PC the program counter starts at an int and this returns an int and the int it returns is not going to be this I don't even need to do the return PC plus two here anymore um, did I have an output function here somewhere at one time just kidding. Um, yeah. So we do still have the output function. And it's still going to print to output. Um, yeah, when we're done here, we don't need to return anything, in fact. We just are dumping it to output. That's fine var pc all right I suppose i don't need to declare where this starts uh so var pc is going to start at zero and there's no signal retained from the program to the next execution and our input is going to be a one all right so now if i run it it's going to tell me dude you didn't define an opcode nine um but also something about my code is missing a brace somewhere. A 
or has an extra brace somewhere or um, is missing a return value or doesn't have a consistent value type at, if we're returning so all right so yeah that's going forever um, at least it didn't uh, at least it parsed I would say compile but that's a bit ambitious all right, so let's implement the new opcode instructions. So we have a jump, and we have a step. Oh, else zero. All right, nine, do something. What's our new operation for nine? Adjust the relative base for the jump instruction. Okay. Um, that's great. Wait. Val V int. Um, this is a data class. Oh my goodness. So I started all this by producing some notion of an instruction where the instruction itself is not going to be a mutable type and i keep getting coerced into trying to make a computer that retains state and stuff like that and if i need to have some sort of special thing i could pass in a lambda or some sort of function a method reference that increments something that represents the relative base I mean, it's kind of the path I've gone down with mode here already. Um, well, so I am annoyed that function step is going to have to return more than the return address now. Wait. Where is all the rest of my computation being done? Down here. Do I even need some sort of processing for an opcode here? Yes. Uh, nine has a single parameter, so it's going to step the opcode by two forward. Um, and here we have a mode and a program counter. Um, and I guess we're going to have now a base. Um, and step itself doesn't need that, but... Um, so now I'm going to get a compile error. Compiles the wrong word because this is a script, but still... Oh, I'm sorry. Step does require this because this parameter will be passed into jump. All right, it's so program counter base. We can do that. And then down here where we're doing the jump, we got base. And when this nine, <sighs> base is equal to something. Um, Base is a special register. Uh, so initially is equal to zero. And I, like this says, um, yeah, that's a bit annoying. So this is, we're just trying to read the value. at a given address. Oh, sorry, we're trying to... Let's see. I've confused myself already. So we have a new opcode. I think that opcode can operate in any mode.
to adjust the relative base by the value of its only parameter. The base increases or decreases by the value of the parameter. And is the value of the parameter the value based on if I look up something else in memory? Um, let's see. Can this opcode 9 be used in immediate mode and position mode and relative mode and all that shit? Or are we going to keep things not insane? Um, also, I need to introduce the new memory mode. Uh, base equals base plus... Um, memory PC plus one um, wait what oh I'm using the wrong sorts of delimiters here I need brackets not parentheses because this is not Scala all right, we're going to assume that that's fine. And then, all right. Oh, here's the load instruction that would have spared me some confusion earlier. We're not using it anymore, so might as well get rid of it. Um, so well, now that we have this whole new relative addressing mode, Um, oh, right, so I was saying that the mode is equal to V over 100, and mode would get passed in as a parameter to some of these things, and if this is equal to 1, do one thing, um, else if it's equal to 2, do another thing else p yeah all right um is this worth bring breaking out a case or switch or whatever there is in kotlin for this uh, if mode mod 10 is equal to 2 asdf else if that uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this immediately returns p. Else, if mode mod 10 is equal to 2, asdf else p. So here we're going to say uh, p plus base. And to do that, we do need to define what base is. So, um, I know I've been putting base after the program counter. Um, we're going to change that up so I don't drive myself too crazy. Because sometimes I've got P and sometimes i got PC based on whether we're talking about a parameter or a program counter. Um, so I just need to make sure I'm consistent about my consumption of this thing. So let's put that before PC. Um, here we're going to say base int. And where else are we using base? We're using it down here. And we're using it here. All right, and now, yeah, so we have, we're going to read using a mode. Why did I put base before mode? That wasn't where I intended to put it. I'm not sure it matters, but I intend to put it before PC, but after mode because mode was introduced first. Um, 
gosh. Habits die hard. All right, and now what? So, base here, base there. Uh, got less than and equal comparisons. What else do we have? All right, that requires it for output. Wouldn't surprise me if input required it. All right, memory. Oh, um, mode P1, mode base P2. All right, and then over here we need mode base P. Yeah, this is more and more starting to show how my code degrades um, with new requirements. I'm also doing this in Scala um, and learning a lot of Scala in the process, although I'm not retaining it very well. I'm exercising a lot of Scala. Um, all right, did this blow up yet? Nope, not yet. Beautiful. All right, they did mention this would be tested. Index 100. Okay. Uh, if, uh, if a very large number just means 100, um, then I can manage that. But I'm not optimistic about where this is going. Else memory P. So, of course, that produces an out of bounds exception. I guess I want to pad my input with some kind of load function after all. I'm sorry, no. So, here we got a mutable list. Um,. Let's see. Val L is equal to, yeah, no, val program, program is equal to uh, this thing. Um, program. And size, yeah, I don't know. Pad, yeah. I mean, I could convert this to a map, but that's just, I don't like this. I don't like where this is going. So if I can submerge subvert the problem, understanding that if I had to, I could make data structures, but I don't have to. Um, write pad list. Pad start. No. Kotlin pad list. No. Ah. Uh, Hatlin pad end. Yeah, that's not exactly it either. List padding. List extend. No. Resize. Mutable list. Add all, clear, remove all, size, binary search, binary search by chunked, windowed, binaries, oh, that's it. Um, to short array, 
A long array, a float array, a C string array, sum by sorted with sort descending slice shuffle. Reversed, replace all, remove all, reduce, partition, min width minus max assign, map, last. Um, yeah, none of that's really what I'm looking for. Is there a simpler way to extend an array? Probably not in the current Kotlin, but if I had to guess, someday they'll come up with it. You can choose to write something like copy of array, size plus one. Yeah. You can also do array plus string, try list.toArray. So do I really need to convert this thing into an array of fixed dimension? Maybe. And then load it into the array. List dot no, that's C plus plus. Yeah. I mean a list isn't meant to be resized, but um even a mutable list is not really meant to be resized. For each get parallel stream, remove a splitterator, add all, contains all, last index of as reverse, shuffle, sort, sort by, sort, sort by descending, sort with, sum count, intersect, fold to mutable list indices, add all, any is iterable, associate by two, chunked, distinct, filter, fold right, um, minus none, partition, plus assign, reduce right, I'm thinking they just want me to use a map. So, all right, we're going to say list of this. Um, to indexed map indexed. I don't know. Um, Kotlin list to indexed map. Map indexed. All right, I actually need to specify the transform. I can't just use some default thing that says use the value as the value and the position as uh, it's not going to be that bad um, index int comma t to r yeah that's converting a list to a map in Kotlin according to Bildung. Huh? Yeah, they, okay, that guy doesn't have indexed map. Um, with index? No, that produces an iterable, but that's different. Kotlin map indexed returns list of any instead of list of my object. Cost of language feature. How to iterate over a string with indices. Yeah, so I'm whatever. I would prefer to find at least one code example showing how to use indexed map or map indexed. Um, let's try map indexed as the search term. Call 
collection operations in Scot in Kotlin. I was about to say Scotland, and then realized that's a different thing. All right, assert equals list of this list dot map indexed parameter, comma parameter. All right, whoops. Map indexed, not using these, but using those. A comma B. I am so confused. Applying the given transform function. Oh. No, that's not what I wanted at all. I just wanted a map. To mutable list, to this, to that. Oh, to hash set. Alright, no, that's not what I wanted either. Alright, so I guess I'm going to have to go to my program here. And say this is a map of int to int. Do, is there such a thing as a mutable map of int to int? Gosh, I really don't want to go there. Uh... Okay, so what was the last thing I did to break this? I changed the list to a mutable list. Um, and I guess here... I'm going to create a function load that takes a program, which is just a list, and um, we'll call execute with program mutable list and input. No, actually. Forget that. Just declare this right in line here. And say val memory is equal to program that to mutable list. And then we don't need to declare this as being mutable down here. But still, um, all right. Val array is equal to array a hundred. Yeah. Um, and our memory is going to be equal to, I don't know. Oh, hang on. Let's try this. Is that no good? Why is that no good? Unresolved reference array. Alright, do I have to say like new array? I'm still confusing things. This is not the operator I think it is. Ay, ay, ay. Add all. Uh, all right. That's still not what I think it is. Um, Kotlin list add a hundred values. Generate a list with lambdas in Kotlin. List fill or list tabulate. Is there a list fill here? Int array as list. All right. Uh, 
Oh. Uh. Array is still undefined. I don't know what the default value in an int array is, but I assume it's zero. We'll find out. <laughs> Wait, what did I just break? Other than everything. Are we saying that a mutable list with an add all produces a list and not a mutable list? And therefore I have to actually stick this at the end? then I can't do... Do I have to do this twice? No. Okay, so what's the problem here? None of the following candidates is applicable because of receiver type mismatch. Oh my god. <laughs> Create extension function boolean to mutable list. How about no? Um memory dot add all let's do that down here there we go that wasn't so impossible also we could extend the dimension of our damn little box all right warning fun jump base is never used Wait, am I not using... How could jump not be using the base? It's probably because I paid no attention while writing this. Read. Alright, where is read defined? Oh, read is this thing. That takes a list and an int and an int. And produces an int. Well, now we got four ints. So we got memory, and here's where we stuck the base in there. Um, and we'll just have to figure out how to get um, functions that do what we need them to do to work. All right, so down here. Uh, this is going to take a list and four ints. Um, mode base p. Oh. Hang on. So, my god. Could I have made things more confusing? Maybe. <laughs> oh my goodness. That base is getting passed around the universe here. Um, yeah. So because I'm defining the function over here, I don't need to pass base around so often. Um, so the same thing to do would be to actually remove base from the jump instruction um, declaration there so I don't have to pass it around the world like this. Uh, that said, it's, jump is like one of the few places where we'd want to use that the most. Or not. Um, name shadowed base. Yeah, okay. You win. You win. We're gonna get rid of base here, there, and everywhere. Ironically, this somehow makes things a little simpler. Um, so this was reporting that I didn't need to pass base into jump because jump didn't use base. Um, and now because jump isn't using base, it isn't necessary to pass it in there nor is it necessary to pass that in here nor wherever the heck I 
passed it in there because the read function already has um, base referenced directly here. And this is being redefined on the fly with the new value. So that's exciting and scary, but mostly exciting. All right. Kotlin.unit. Nailed it. All right. So what does output do these days? Um, int. All right. Oh. So this actually is supposed to return an int. Um, I think this one is too. Read is supposed to return an int. Compute. I think that's supposed to return an int. No. Alright. So, does this have a return value anymore? Probably not. Um, I still don't feel like moving print line outside of this, so we're going to keep it there. Awesome. So basically everything's broken. Um, Alright, so what should this sample program do? And what is it doing? So... It should take no input and produce itself as output 109, 1, 204, minus 1, 1001, 100, 1, a hundred, a thousand, eight, a hundred, sixteen, one oh one, a thousand six, one oh one, zero ninety nine, Kotlin dot unit. That's not bad. All right. Um, next program should output a sixteen digit number. We can do that, maybe. I'm not so optimistic anymore, but we can try. Paste. Run. That is not a 16. We're printing out Kotlin.unit twice. That's lovely. I suppose I don't need to call print line both here and in the actual execution. Uh, so, even so, that's not a 16 digit number. Um, it's almost a 16 digit number, if you look at it backwards. So, what am I doing wrong? Uh, 1102, big number, big number, 747990. Is this even using the new addressing mode? Should it be? So we got read here. Read takes a base. Does it do anything with the base? If mode is 1, return P. Mode is 2, return memory at p plus base. Um, yeah, there's a more concise way I can write this. Else, <laughs> if that, else, p. Brilliant. Yeah, that's super intelligible. Um, so, if the mode is equal to 2, return p plus base, else p. Uh, 
1102 means multiply um, taking both parameters in immediate mode storing the result in 7 and then 4799 I'm confused. We're going to multiply those numbers, store it in 7, write the number, or output the number that's in 7. And is my problem here that int types don't go up to that range? Do I really need to recode all this to use numbers instead of ints? Um, probably. All right. You win. All right, so this is going to be a list of, that's not what I meant to open. This is not a list of int. You just thought it was a list of int. That's a list of longs. And this is going to be a long array. All right. And then we're going to recode every freaking thing to work with gigantic numbers. All right, so, I mean, I could have just genericized this to number, I guess. But um, I don't anticipate doing this with decimals right now. All right. Um, Wait, can I do a find to replace? That's a class hierarchy. That's not a find and replace. Oh, jeez. All right. Uh, IntelliJ idea find and replace. Control Shift R to switch to replace in path dialog box. Or replace in path, but I want to just do this in one file. I'm not looking to do this for an entire path. Found Control F, found several other things that I wasn't looking for. Um, Finance selection. I just want to replace the damn thing. Now I have to open up Notepad to do it. Control R to open the replace in file window. All right. Long match case. Replace all. And if it happens to be incorrect, that's Fine. All right. <sighs> now this requires some frequent casting between ints and longs because we don't have the memory space to do stuff with longs here. So we're going to now convert back things like PC is going to be an int. Um, P1. I guess until I know whether or not that's an... Okay, I guess we're just going to cast things to um, int when we need to look things up. Uh, that seems painful. Operator not equal cannot be applied to long and int. Okay. So I guess we're going to do 0L all over the place. PC plus 1. Uh, we're going to do some 2int conversion every time we need to access something in an array. Truly, this is the greatest 
problem ever. Uh, all right. Op is going to be. So our instruction, I think we can assume, is going to be an int, hopefully. Okay. Our program counter is probably going to be an int. Maybe. Uh, memory at P1. It's going to be equal to ID. I don't even remember what some of this stuff is for. Um, hey, how's it going? We're just doing the advent of code challenge, and I am gradually losing my mind doing it. It's exciting. There is no need for things to be this complicated. <laughs> oh my god. So, I dot mode. Let's require that to be an int. Require that to be an int. Required long. So mode is going to be an int always. Um, the relative memory offset is going to be an int and not a long. Program counter. Am I using that always as a program counter or am I sometimes using it as something else? Oh, in this context, it's always as a memory address offset. So, um, these are longs, but this one can be an int. These two, it's more complicated. Over here, we've got input. Input P1 is the memory at this address. I don't remember what that's for. Let's skip that and come back to it. Step. Memory I dot mode PC and R. Mode is again going to be an int. Program counter int. All right, jump with a mode and a program counter. Mode int program counter int. Um, read is going to take. A list of long and an int and an int and produce a long. P1. Here, this is going to be converted to an int as this. I suppose I could produce twice as many functions, it might still work. <laughs> Interesting. I don't even remember. Like, what is that site? Yeah. I'm going to just focus on my code in here. There are some things I might do for entertainment, but that sort of voice acting isn't one of the sort of things I'm focusing on right now. Uh, it does sound amusing. It's got my curiosity what that's about. But it seems that I have a predisposition to be cu curious about a lot of things. 
Oh no. Dang it. What did my bot do? Oh, there's a YouTube video. Nice. Yeah. I'll check it out. So we got the YouTube video for the huh, Chef John. Lately I've seen that some chefs have been publishing a lot of YouTube videos and recipes and stuff. Um, which is pretty cool. What have I messed up here? Oh. Well, this is going to be an int in this case. Oh, but sometimes that's a long. That's the issue. Here I have to cast the damn thing. There we go. Because sometimes that might be a 16-bit integer or 16-bit number mode all right so this i resolved it's going to return along but all right and here program counter plus one. Oh. So I initially declared that as an int incorrectly. Well, no. No, that's ridiculous. Um, we're never going to have a gigantic offset in that variable. And if we do, shame on the people who made this problem. <laughs> oh, man. What else is going on here? int any all right instruction oh take the thing at the address course that to an int type all right an i dot step i dot step returns what now it's equal to when this return all these ints Oh no, but this returns an any type because these don't have a uniform return type. PC plus 3. PC here is an int. Um, or I'm just going to assert that this does return an int even though it might not have the compiler figure out what I'm doing wrong. All right, so we read a value, and this becomes our new address to which we jump. Um, and I'm going to just assume that that address is somewhere in the same universe as the memory space of my computer, and that it's an int. All right, and then this here, id. It is a long for some reason. Oh, uh, yeah, so our, yeah, okay, p1 being this address, fine. Um, what else have I missed? Base and p. Required a long, found an int. Wait, where is this p coming from? M mode p. Read. Read requires. Oh, p could be a long. Yeah, no, this is right. Um. So here, the final parameter has to be of type long. And does everything... No, we still have some compile problems. What's wrong now? R. Um, yeah, so my function I defined doesn't quite satisfy the constraints that this imposes. No, this parameter can be of type long. And then this read functions consumed by jump. 
So the read function needs to supply a long value. Um, so now what? P1 to int. Oh. So yeah. That makes some sense. We read values out of memory and then later when we're trying to figure out if they're memory addresses or whether they're just numbers. Only in that context do we decide how to resolve their use. And now what? Is that it? <sighs> Should never have used a statically typed language for this. This task is not suited for um, a statically typed language. All right. Please produce a 16 digit number. Don't even care what it is. Kaboom. Okay, well, that's close enough. All right. This program should output the centered number. Uh, okay. Let's try that. We'll look forward to rewriting this all in Scala. I'll tell you that. All right, so run it in test mode by providing it the value one. It'll perform a series of checks, etc. All right, does that number kind of sort of look like this one? I think it does. 11, 25, 80, 90, 90, 90, 90, whatever. Yeah, close enough. So, um, what? key code does this produce? All right, here's our program. It's delightful little easy to debug, ridiculously large program. All right. Uh, well, program equals list of this thing. Um, go. <sighs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brilliant program. Inferred type is list of int, but list of long was expected. Can we just do the coercion thing and Try that again. Two hundred three. Now I'm also curious. Now I need to know Kotlin number types. Is there a number type that's just called number? Yes. So maybe I don't want to use uh, long when I can use just number. Superclass for all platform classes representing numeric values. So. Yes, this is a game where uh, I solve coding problems that I impose upon myself for no damn reason. Um. All right, so we're going to make another improvement. <clears throat> Not really. Number. YOLO. We're going to learn something. Do things the hard way. All right. Number array. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know. Does it even matter what our data types are? I'm reminded of, um, oh wow, <laughs> unresolved reference, because I'm not requiring that all my parameters be like of the same data type. All right, so we're going to stick with uh, type of long. That's fine. I'm reminded of a Al Stewart song. Um, do I have this right? I certainly don't, but... What 
what's it called? It's, it's of course it's about navigating on a boat, and he's making some references about uh, how he's going to get completely lost at sea, and he doesn't even care. And I feel like I'm in the same kind of mode here. I think it's from the album Time Passages. Oh crap. My answer's too low. Well, shit. How about zero? Zero looks like a good answer, right? Alright, we're never gonna get through this one. <laughs> Find the captain and tell him we've thrown away the key, something, something. I don't know. Run it in test mode. By, oh, that's how you run it in test mode. When you verify it's functional, then should only produce a single value, the boost key code. Well, certainly the boost key code is not zero, right? I think we can agree on that. All right, so we're just gonna run the program in test mode. It's gonna tell me everything that my software is doing wrong. 203. Um, so 203 has got a problem. In a way that's useful to know so if I'm doing an input instruction, um, well, I guess, yeah, I would expect that that would fail. Because I'm not providing the base here. I feel like I've been completely outsmarted. Um, all right. Like, I'm just struggling to implement the damn thing, and somebody wrote this in a way that can tell me what instructions I failed to implement. And I feel most embarrassed. Um, and part of the reason for my embarrassment is that at work, we just fixed a bug that we've been tracing for God knows how long. Um... Oh my goodness. So. Um, oh, do I really need to parameterize input with a mode now? Is that what's going on? Can input be put into relative position mode? Because I thought input... I'm confused. Excuse me. I thought input could only be received in immediate mode. And now I'm being given another in direction on this. 203 would be a read instruction. Let's see, what am I missing? Yeah, getting lost is probably fine, because it's just a game. Santa's just lost in space, having delivered presents. He's halfway across the galaxy. And like Zug, we're just going to leave him stranded in space. <laughs> I'm joking. We'd never forget Jeb. Never. Ah. <laughs> uh. I've got to figure out how to play KSP at some point. But gosh, I was just glad this last week to get Stockfish going again. So I'm confused. Yeah, they introduced this new relative base concept. Um... Needs support for parameters in relative mode. They could be interpreted as a position. 
Relative mode parameters don't count from address 0. I still think I might have implemented my thing correctly. Like, I don't know how why I'm getting an error code of 203. I mean, we could take a look at the program and try to assert my correctness over it. PC. Because it was asserted, like, back in problem 2 or something like that, that read instructions or input instructions are always going to be in immediate mode. Am I just hallucinating that? Let's go back. Calendar. Day 2. To a computer, it's got instructions and parameters and number of parameters in an instruction. And I guess it must have been day five that we introduced this notion of parameter modes. And it was pretty clearly specified that some instructions didn't have this concept. Um, Parameters that an instruction writes to will never be in immediate mode. That's different than what I was saying. Relative mode could still apply to a parameter, but immediate mode cannot apply to such a parameter. So that's why I'm getting a 203. It's because this ridiculous spec requires that I have to do some ridiculous things. So yeah, I need to parameterize my input function to look like every one of these other damn functions. Um, so we got a mode, a program counter, got a read function. Um, except this is a function that's just going to write to memory but it's going to sometimes write with a relative offset. Um, and that relative offset is termed base here. Um, and we're going to say if mode mod 2 is equal to 0, no, it's equal mod, mode mod 10 is equal to 2, PC plus base plus one. This can't be anywhere near right, but hopefully that's kind of sort of close. I'm probably supposed to create a function that calculates an offset to pass in. Uh, I dot mode. All right. Oh. Apparently, generally, I'm putting the base before the program counter and not after it. So we'll keep the mode and base together. All right. Um, great. That's delightful. Um, PC plus one. That can't be right either. Oh my gosh. So I want to read the value that's in there and not apply the change here, um, but down here, uh, P1 plus base else P1. So that's the register I want to write to. Hopefully this is kind of sort of close this time. Also, I should probably rerun the original tests. Also, we got an index out of bounds. Index 2009. Size of 1073. So, guess what that means?
We're going to pad some more zeros on here. I'm going to take up my whole freaking memory with lots of zeros. Here, let's pad, I don't know. Here, let's add 10,000 zeros at the end of the program. Is that enough? <laughs> if this tanks the stream, it's all Advent of Code's fault. Uh, Twitch says I'm the only non-bot watching, and I can't help. I don't know any coding. Much because, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to calm down a little bit here. I'm just kind of on edge, because, like, being this error code 203 from this nasty program, and this program somehow asserts that, like, your instructions do what they're supposed to do, and I could read my way through all 1,000 of these, but it might take a little while. Um, it's probably more efficient that I do something else. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm stuck on day nine. I'll try not to break the internets too hard. So all the other example programs still work. It's just this last one. So 1102, so the last digit here is a two, two means multiply, and these one ones mean instead of going to look up things in memory, just use this number and use that number and go multiply them together. Stick the answer over here. And then 1007, seven means jump if that number is equal to this number, I think or is not equal to or something I don't know there's some something there and yeah I could print out every step of whatever the crap this is doing but 203 and 0 is not um, it's not the answer 203 is an error it's telling me that my three instruction is not right. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. I really have to lawyer like what is meant by this relative mode thing. The parameters interpreted as a position, like position mode, parameters in relative mode can be read from or written to. The important difference is that the relative mode parameters don't count from address zero. Instead, they count from a value called the relative base. So I'm wanting to read this P1 value. And then if my mode is two, then I'm wanting to use that number. And that mode is taken by taking my instruction thing. Uh, mm -mm -mm. What confuses me is if I'm supposed to be doing this mod 10 or divide by 10 mod 10 or whatever. If I'm just inputting a number. It will never be in immediate mode, but that's okay. Um, but it might be in relative addressing mode. So, yeah, this morning I did a stream in which I solved one of these problems. Um, and I took a break, uh, ended up solving the problem, and came back and explained how I did it. Right now... I'm debating, do I want to try doing the same sort of thing with this one? Although I think this is much harder and I might not get through it. I think I'd rather hang out and try to solve it. I just don't know what to try. So, 
other than just like using Google to look up what I did wrong. I've padded my memory space with 10,000 zeros, and apparently it must have been enough zeros, but I probably don't need this many. Could probably just tack on another like 3,000 or so. still two oh three zero what's the zero at the end is the zero just what's being returned here somehow it can't be this block here doesn't return a number. It just executes. Huh. 3,000 zeros. 10,000 zeros. Yep. It's a lot of zeros. They just... These test examples are getting progressively... Uh, less helpful and progressively more you go figure out how to test this which is not good in light of the fact that like yeah they're using fancy words to describe some of these things they do explain an example here for example if the relative base is this after the instruction that the relative base would be this um, 109, 19, the relative base would be 29. Oh, my relative base thing is probably like way the crap off because I coded it in a hurry and didn't think too much about it. Um, if the next instruction were 204 minus 34, then the value at address. 1985 would be output but you're not telling me if opcode 9 itself can take a relative base addressing scheme so like here where I'm saying take this number and add on to it the value that's in the next memory address that might not be right because I failed to consider um, the value of the parameter can mean a whole lot of different things here. So I'm not pleased. The examples don't really explain the new issue. They just introduce some new terminology and expect you to figure it out. Which is not too different from how the real world works, but still. Um, for something that's supposed to be a holiday activity that might be enjoyable, um, it seems a bit crazy. Mm hmm. Well, oh, right. All right, now if I'm reading, no, but that's number five. Number five is the things in memory that I have to be written to um, will never be in immediate mode. It could still be in relative mode. Like here, we're writing to an address based on this notion. Um, Oh, this relative base isn't a memory address. That's what confused me. This relative base is just like some other thing that just floats right here. It's not in the memory space. It's a separate register. 
it starts at zero. The address, uh, relative first to is itself plus the current relative base. Hmm. So you can add to and subtract from um, this relative base offset using opcode 9. What confused me is like here you have 109 which you're saying I want to take the value specified by this parameter and use it to adjust that. Um, I'm just going to make a wild guess here. This might be wrong. Yeah, in a sim, in some way, this is kind of cathartic. Like this is less painful than the stuff that you see elsewhere. Um, no, cathartic's the wrong word for that. This is in some way relaxing. Uh, it helps, I don't know, it's a more social sort of thing. Huh, interesting. I just noticed, like, I could scroll all the way down here even though I can't move the text cursor down without hitting the return key to expand the document. So apparently you can scroll the text, like, halfway up this panel. Um, leave a lot of dead space down here. It's kind of unlike other text editors. I don't know why. Yeah. Yep. It's still maddening when they don't explain things right. Um, so my ridiculous thought Is that I'm going to look at the value of i dot mode here, and then what? I was going to try to inline the new value. Um, that might not go well. So this is an int value. All right, I need to actually declare a new function just for this stupid little thing. I'll try not to make it too dumb of a function. Um, yuck, I don't like the name adjust here. I'm not moving a chess piece. So here we have input, here we got adjust, and I'm just going to have this return an int instead of trying to manipulate memory directly. So here's a parameter at pc plus 1. I know, we're going to get rid of the, P, the one part of p1 here. P1, the 1 is an artifact from what I thought I was going to have multiple P's in the same function. Um, now, uh, this is going to be, instead of adjusting memory, we're just going to return uh, the new base value. Else P. The expression's unused. Wait. I didn't do that right, did I? Um, there's so many things I did not do right here. It's breaking my mind. Yes, I have to read the value that was in memory and then use that to do a lookup 
of where to write in memory here. Over here, I need to do a read. But that parameter is directly, well, I don't know if it's used. Input is not what I wanted to change, is it? No. Yeah, it is. Because uh, I don't have a write function. This input is the write function. We have a read function, and if I were halfway sane, I would have called this write. I probably still should. Um, there was some reason I didn't want to call it that. It's because then I'd have to like call this other thing that I call output read. And I already have a read function. So... Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So what am I doing here? I'm so confused. Wait, okay, here, here's read. Read is saying, given the memory space and the instruction mode and the base pointer and the parameter value, if we're in this mode, return the value directly, else return a value based on the relative positioning scheme. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So, This here writes to a memory address. Uh, so it's not subject to this nonsense. Um, but almost everything else is. Um, so the way we consume this is like that. Um, so we get the value out of memory, and then do this thing. Um, now what's the problem with P here? Is the, that's the problem. Uh, we're still going to return an int. And now I have to pass this read function uh, into adjust. So we've got read. Okay. So this is going to return our new offset um, here if I can figure out how to call my function. And it's quite possible I might not be able to figure that out. Um, this requires, uh, it does not require this parameter anymore. Just needs uh, the same things that input needs plus that silly read function at the end. All right, so instead of this input thing here, um, we need the read function, which we haven't defined yet. We define it on the next line. <laughs> Lovely. That's perfect. All right, close enough. Oh no. Mutable list of long found unit. I'm confused. Adjust, oh, I don't want input here. Just kidding. All right, so. 
Type mismatch, list of long, int long, returning long. Found an int. Um, list of long, int long, which returns a long. And it found the program counter because I passed the wrong number of arguments. All right, does this compile-ish? Not yet. Unresolved reference. Yeah, that's what I thought was going to happen. Because I hadn't defined this until after this block executes. But in this scope, I do need it to be defined, even though some of these values can't be resolved yet. So, yeah. That's great. <laughs> so now what? It's the chicken and the egg. Um, well, uh, one solution is to not define it there. Just define it where we need it. Here we go, val r is defined up here. For that to work, I'm sorry, so this is a function now. Um, val r is the same thing as this read here. So, I forget why I kept passing that around instead of just calling read directly. It takes an M, a mode, and a P and calls read with four parameters. Um, where the parameter after the mode is the base. I think I can survive without this function um, as long as I pass base int in as a parameter here because I've got a four argument version of this. Um, and then I've got to pass base there. So we're assigning the value of base based on base plus an adjustment function based on base. What could go wrong? The specification could go wrong, but also my code might not compile. Um, that could go wrong. Return expression requires a function with a block body. Huh? Excuse me? You call my body fat? Or is that what you're talking about? Seeing I'm blocky? I don't think that's what it's saying. But um, a return expression required in a function with a block body. Do I seriously have to say return read here? I thought return was implicit. That, like, Scala style, if I just put something at the end, you would return it? Nope. Array index out of bounds exception minus two. Yeah, I was thinking this might not work. It seemed completely ridiculous to begin with. Um, plus, that wasn't what the error code was reporting. Um... Yeah, so we'll just forget about that. Uh, memory square bracket i plus one to int. And just leave that be. 
Unless I made some stupid mistake and have to do it the other way. Wait, in line only? Line 53. I mean, certainly this is referring to the thing that I just decided I'm not going to be using anymore. Does this compile without warnings now? Unresolved reference. line 53 oh I plus one just kidding I meant to say pook plus one uh, yeah. so I think this is just telling me that a read instruction 203 did something other than what it's supposed to do um, mm -mm. So the next logical thing, unfortunately, <sighs> da, da, da. we have an input function here. We have an input function and we have a thing here called input because I am crazy. What can I call the input to this machine this time? Um, you know, ask for a single input, providing it the value one. Even value might be a better name than input here. Um, so we'll call it value. I don't know. I'll put on any of these things. So I'm guessing that the fact that I renamed that parameter is not going to change this code. If it does, I will be sad. Yeah, so... I don't know what to do. This is telling me that a 3 instruction that inputs is not doing what it's supposed to do. And I'm not convinced. Um, and the only thing that would really convince me is if I dump out this ginormous program and start debugging it myself. And it is much too late for that. I mean, so what we're talking about, just to be clear, we print a line with the opcode on it. And then we print the line with all the numbers on it. watch it burn and it will burn so there's our op code so this this is a multiply compare and jump five whatever that is some other kind of jump multiply this new opcode, new opcode, new opcode, new opcode, new opcode, um, three input, eight compare and jump, five, I don't know. It's kind of a mess already, isn't it? Um, So let's say list of the opcode and memory at PC plus one. Wait, what's the deal? Why won't this go? It's because it's not Scala. Scala, you would say capital list there. In Kotlin, you say list of to produce a list from values. 
So, oh, apparently lists don't have tuple, like, cur uh, they don't have parentheses, they have square brackets. So, yeah, here we've got, I suppose while I'm at it, something else that might be useful to print out might be the base value. Um, since we've got all that going, let's, where do I want to put the program counter in all of this? Um, yeah, so we'll keep things in that order and say what? Um, I got mode here. So we're going to dump out a lot more information. And we could start converting this into English prose about what each thing does. So take the parameter of this number and the one after and do a multiply. And uh, here we're saying compare 63 to something, um, like compare a literal 63, um, because this has a 1 here, compare it to the thing that's in address 0? No. Yeah, base of 0. Oh, I'm sorry, base here, this is just, we have no offset. Here, after we increased our offset by 988, our offset is 988. We increased it by 12 and got this. Increased it by 1,000 to get this. Uh, it stayed at 2,000 for a while. 2,006, 2009, and um, let's see. thousand nine stayed here for a while I guess it remained 2009 the whole time and we never got another nine instruction before we got the funky error message I'm oh, sorry we got a 203 here and soon after encountered a 99 instruction well no I'm not sure why we terminated it's kind of a good question. I'm confused. So... I don't have any of the crap in here about... We can only ex the user is supposed to provide an input value, and they do provide an input value, but they only provided one, and we're going to abort. I don't know. That was a problem we had with the amplifier, where we had a chain of these chips that were hooked up to each other, and um, each of those chips was running to completion without waiting for input. Uh, I don't think we're in that situation here where we're failing to wait for input. Um, so one here is an add. We're going to add, no sorry, one here is our mode. So we're going to take a literal zero. Um, and do a for operation based on that zero. So we're going to output the zero. I don't get it. <sighs> I mean, I guess I could print out more stuff here. I'm just confusing myself more and more every time I print something additional out there. Um, so got a uh, 
base program counter instruction mode instruction operation we got the memory at the program counter memory at program counter plus offset and we could do that for a few offsets here um, and maybe it'll make more sense that way But probably this won't make any sense until we actually start converting it to English. So the first column here is the base offset of 2009. Second column is the program counter. So we got 50 steps into the program using the 2009 offset. At step 48, um, we had no mode so we're doing an instruction number four and then a four is a what again a four is a output okay fine oh but so i'm guessing we shouldn't have gotten to this output because this previous thing should have done something other than what it did um so this is a 10 I'm oh, sorry, this is a 5 instruction here, and a 5 I think is jump based on equality of values. Uh, 5 is jump based on memory mode, memory, memory. I wonder, is my jump screwed up maybe? Could be. Our examples don't really help me figure it out. All right, I'll see you back in a bit if I still happen to be here. You've probably had it out by now, but um, it's good to know. <laughs> All right, 41, we're going to jump conditionally. No, 8, 8 is a what? Eight is compute based on equality. So we're going to compare whether a literal that uh, can that be right? Oof. A one thousand eight. What values am I printing out? Memory 0, 1, 2, and 3. 0, 1, 2, and 3 here. So our operation is 8 with this mode, which says we're going to take address 1000 and the value of 0 and check if. How many parameters does 8 take again? Compute for quality. Based on address 1000 being equal to 0. And if it is equal to 0, jump to 63. Now, how does 63 impair the jump instruction? I'm not sure that it does. Our jump instruction is affected by this relative base stuff. Um, opcode 9 adjusts the relative base by the value of its only parameter. Relative mode parameters and position mode parameters refer to the same address, provided that the relative base is zero. <laughs> Parameters in mode two. Uh, 
Okay. Like position mode, parameters in relative mode can be read from and can be written to. Like position mode. Okay. So I got a 203 here telling me that I'm not handling um, this like position mode. I thought I was. I read the value P and I said if um, the mode What was my failed instruction? Where was there even a 3 anywhere near any of this? I see a 4. I see an 8. I see a 5. These numbers can do something that results in a 3, but I think here's the 3. Here's the 203. So those are the numbers we read, and this program is asserting that I got the wrong output, um, 2523. All right, 203. So yes, you're right that our mode would be a 2. Two or three zero a thousand eight a thousand, which means what? It means we're gonna read, and we're gonna read into position two thousand nine, and that's all we're gonna do there. Huh. And then later on, we're going to assert that the value in position 2009 is right, I guess. Why are we, why do we have two instructions that both try to read into that position? Like here. No, I'm sorry, this is a 9 instruction. I got confused because 209 and 3 looks a lot like 203 and 3. But they have nothing in common. So I probably just want to print out for a read instruction before and after. What's my, what's the damages there? and trust that this sample program is actually telling me what I need to know. Um, gosh, my autocomplete to put the comment in there didn't quite do what I hoped. There we go. So here we've got input. And I'm checking. Yeah, here we do have a 2. If mode mod 10 is equal to 2. That looks right. Am I passing the parameters in in the right order? Mode, then base, then PC? Mode, base, PC. And then the actual input value. Um... Is this input value the thing I'm screwing up? No, that can't be. All right. Um, oh. I am f 
so badly confused myself. So the input value to this program, we happen to know that it is a one, right? Unless I like misread the instructions. I'll ask for the value one, perform a series of checks. Uh, it seem okay. Am I actually inputting a one or am I being an idiot? I mean, this looks like a one to me, but it wouldn't surprise me if I'm still messing it up somehow. Yes, yeah, so this value seems to be preserving the one. Later on, some comparison is taking place that's concluding I didn't do the right thing. And we're printing out a 203. This is just a fancy step to print out a 203. But um, that's just based on the previous step, which here 5 means what? I think five is jump. You know, is jump if zero or jump if non-zero or something. Five or six jump. Um, the definition of five is that if this is p one is not equal to zero. Then we read this, else read program counter plus three. Um, I wonder, is there some problem comparing values of different types? No, this is a long array. So if I were to try to stick ints into it, that would be problematic. Um, that's why all these parameters are of type long. I can't write to a memory address here. Um, where are all the places I'm writing to memory? Just in case I'm writing in bad value. There might be a difference between int zero and long zero that might be biting me here. Wrapped into a reference object to be modified when captured in a closure. That's concerning. Well, it's just something to think about. Um, so we have several things called compute. We have less, we have equal. Wait, compute. All right, compute does compute uh, and cast the result as a long, even though this is an int right here. I guess all these things return a long. Instructions going to be an int. Yeah, you're not wrong. The tests probably a good idea. Maybe this is something I write in Scala and then come back and try to write it in Kotlin again. Maybe that'll save my sanity. Um, 
I had such high hopes, had such high hopes. Pineapple pie in the sky, hopes and dreams. All right, so how did this conclude 203? It's 203 got printed as a result of this saying output as a result of this having jumped because um, why did this jump because the value at memory address 63 was not a literal 58 um, and this number five here I think is a jump if values are not equal. I'm oh, sorry, this is saying if the value at 63 is not zero. And the value at 63 is computed by the previous instruction which says compare equality of um, address a thousand and zero and address a thousand and no ay 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 does that make sense why would anything be an address a thousand I'm not understanding I feel like whoever generated their own int code computer and drew up these problem specifications didn't really um, they produced a lot of numbers but might not have gone through much beta testing before releasing this problem and a lot of people are smart enough to figure this out but under this circumstance I seem not to be saying that failed and this should have just read directly into address 2009 and I don't see anything else that would have touched address 2009 that's what's got me confused There are, are there other instructions that are using relative addressing? Not after that. So you have some twos up here, but after that we're not using relative addressing at all. <sighs> like here we got a 10. A whole bunch of 10s there, but... Now this two was the last two in this block. Two two oh nine. Two two oh nine. Two two oh three. Three is read, and so we're gonna read directly into. Well. I'm not sure if that's supposed to read into 2009 or into address 0. Um, maybe I'm reading into the wrong address. Maybe this is just completely off base. Ironically. If this is off base. I could just get rid of this stuff here. Just say memory at p is equal to id. Um, can I go back to look at day five? Day five states that what? parameters the instructions write to will never be in immediate mode. 
makes no mention of other modes that it could be in. It could be in relative addressing mode. So yeah, we got parameter modes, etc., etc. So I am not too excited about this. I'm thinking probably I did this incorrectly. Probably I can just say um, this is a memory address that we write to. It's not in a relative addressing scheme. still fails. Mode is never used. So I don't know what's going on. I guess I could print out the value of a lot of these things. Um, uh, so we got a list of mode, base, PC, and id. And I don't say list here, we say list of. Um, Why not throw this big, big old expression over here? Why not dump that in here too? So every time we have to do an input, figure out where that's going. A modes 2, a base 2009. Yeah, so the address it's trying to put that at is 2009. Um, PC is 25. That's where we're reading the program at. ID is the input value of 1. Everything about that seems to match up, and yet we're told that this is the instruction that's failing. Um, three meaning input and two being the mode. So I'm not sure. I'm very confused what I could be doing wrong here. Um, Cause that looks like everything I'm supposed to be doing. Let's comment out the memory listing and put back in this here. Let's see if we can get something else out of this. It might be tricky to differentiate. No, maybe not. All right, so there's our solitary 203 instruction here. Now what are we trying to do? Jump, jump, wait, compare, jump, compare, jump, compare, jump. Um, another jump? No, this is output. This just dumps a literal 203. So I think that means that our previous jump actually did jump which means that this compare, where's our five? I'm oh, sorry, where's our eight? Eight means compute if values are equal. We're checking if the value at address 1008 is le uh, equal to a literal 1000. And storing the result of that comparison uh, 
No. 1008 is the instruction comparing the value at 1000 to 0, storing the result at 63, and then 63 is not equal to 58. I don't get it. No, 10, 5. A 5 is a jump. We're going to read based on that mode. Again, all these things are... I don't see a 2 here. So... Um, yeah, we're going to take the value at 63, compare that with a 58, don't know why the fuck that would be a 58, but store the result in 4. Um, so, how could that have failed? Um, I don't know. If read of this is not equal to 0L, Could it be some other kind of value here? Wait, our mode? No. What does read return? Does read return a long? I think it needs to. It does. Yeah. Could this comparison fail because ints and longs are different beasts? Maybe. Uh, this doesn't feel right. Um, I mean, we can try it. Yeah, I didn't think that would work. If this conversion is not equal to zero, do something. Um, Sign is not equal to zero. And here, if the sign is equal to zero, I think that's another way to do sign based comparisons and perhaps might be more reliable for large numbers. But yeah. So I'm just super stumped. I'll have to give this some rest and some thought. We spent an hour here with me mulling about this and not making any progress, and it's not getting any better anytime soon, so um, it's appropriate to get some rest, or at least to make an attempt to. So um, thanks for humoring me. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'll try to produce some better content next time. I'm Struggling to try to catch up with this, uh, with what coworkers are up to at the moment. Um, they're making really good progress on these uh, these challenges, and I was traveling last week, so that was occupying a lot of my mental space. I wasn't really heavily focusing on this, and now I'm trying to catch back up for the first year that I'm doing this, and this freaking int code computer that doesn't even do encode stuff like it's lovely we got through problem this morning we got through problem tonight got maybe a third of the way through this one um, and we'll just take it from there all right have a good night